Hey, good morning. It's Patricia Murphy. It's Monday. This is Seattle Now. What happens when a police officer violates policy, uses too much force over and over, and even commits a crime on duty? In the case of one Auburn officer, he stays on the job. KUOW's Amy Radel will tell us why and how a new plan is supposed to address these situations. But first, let's get you caught up. The U.S. Supreme Court hears arguments today in a separation of church and state case involving a former Bremerton football coach. Joe Kennedy defied Bremerton High School's order to stop praying on the field. That cost him his job, and then he sued. Kennedy says kneeling in prayer on the 50-yard line was his private religious expression and First Amendment right. Lower courts have disagreed with him, but now it's up to the Supremes. They're expected to issue a ruling by the end of June. The National Labor Relations Board is suing Starbucks after allegations the company retaliated against three workers who were involved in union organizing. In a press release Friday, the NLRB says one worker was disciplined, suspended, and discharged. Another was constructively discharged, and a third was put on unpaid leave. Starbucks told NPR it disagrees with the claims. The company added that the employees were terminated because they violated company policies. And a welcome sight for waterfront businesses over the weekend. Thousands of tourists disembarking a Norwegian cruise line's ship at Pier 66. All passengers over age 12 had to show proof of vaccination before boarding. The Port of Seattle says it expects nearly 300 cruises carrying 1.2 million passengers to come through this summer. Hey there, just a note before we get started, we're talking about police violence today, including details about a police shooting that ended a man's life. You can meet us back here tomorrow if you need to. Here's the show. In May of 2019, 26-year-old E.J. Strickland went to his ex-girlfriend's house in Auburn. He had a bit too much to drink. She called the police. He called his parents, who started driving over to take him home. Before they arrived, E.J. was shot and killed by Auburn police officer Kenneth Lyman. Everyone agrees on those facts. What's not as clear is whether Officer Lyman was justified in using deadly force. We're not convinced that there was any imminent uh, risk of serious bodily injury to these officers. E.J. was on the ground. They put him on the ground. They started the fight by punching him. E.J. never got off the ground. His face was down. He shot in the back of the head. I'll just say it troubles me to, to wonder what the real facts are. Ed Moore is the attorney representing the Strickland family. They're suing the city of Auburn and Officer Lyman over E.J.'s death. Officer Lyman says he feared for his life because he thought E.J. got a hold of a knife. This is not the first time Officer Lyman has come under scrutiny for use of force. Amy Radel is here to tell us more. She reports on police and politics for KUOW. Amy, good to have you. Thank you. Hi, thanks. So we outlined the broad strokes of Officer Lyman's interaction with E.J. Strickland. Let's talk about how Officer Lyman describes that evening. So Lyman has said that the officers, he and another officer, were standing outside with Strickland, and then Strickland's behavior changed. It got more physical, and a prosecutor's analysis says, you know, Lyman initially tried to de-escalate the situation, said, oh, what would your mom think of you, you know, for doing this? But that didn't work. And then Lyman says he feared he was going to be assaulted. He and another officer tackled Strickland to the ground, and then Lyman says he felt something pressing against his leg, and it appeared that a knife he was carrying fell out of his pocket. He says Strickland got the knife and refused to drop it. And then Officer Lyman shot Strickland in the back of the head. Strickland's ex-girlfriend was a witness and her account is a little different. She says she heard Officer Lyman tell Strickland to drop the knife. She thinks she heard Strickland respond, what knife are you talking about? Then she heard the sound of something hitting the ground and then the sound of a gunshot. Really interesting. This shooting also wasn't the only time Officer Lyman's use of force was called into question. He went on to commit a hit and run with a box truck in 2020. Tell me what happened there. 
Yeah, and this is a case I was actually looking at before the the federal lawsuit was filed in the Strickland case because it was just so surprising. Um, so apparently, Lyman was driving a SWAT van from Auburn to a call in Federal Way, and he had a collision with a truck that was driven by a man named Peter Manning. Um, Manning was you know sitting in traffic, and they heard the lights and sirens coming. He tried to pull over. There was so much traffic he couldn't pull over all the way, and then he felt the bump of um, the SWAT van hitting his truck. Truck. And, you know, he thought the officers would stop and check on him. And then he just entered this odyssey of trying to, you know, resolve what had happened. I mean, he called 911 and he says the dispatcher thought he was pranking them by saying, oh, I just got hit by a police officer. The dispatcher hung up on him. Now we have documents from the police department's own internal investigation that they launched about this. And it confirms that Lyman made the decision to keep going to the call, not to stop, not to check on, on the people in the truck. Um, Lyman says he was so convinced that they couldn't possibly be injured. Uh, Officer Lyman was given a written reprimand for violating his department policies by breaking the law. Um, It's a misdemeanor to leave the scene of a collision. And if you injure someone, it can be a felony. The Auburn City Attorney says they are aware of this potential misdemeanor, but they haven't received a referral from the police department. So it's unclear where that stands and, you know, if Officer Lyman would ever be charged for the hit and run. What a bizarre experience. You know, what else do we know about Officer Lyman's history? Well, so because Peter Manning sued the department and the city, um, he's gotten some more internal police documents. There were three incidents that Lyman responded to, Officer Lyman responded to in 2018, where he's described internally as having used excessive force. Um, We have a document that records what they call a counseling session. This is um, where he sat down with a Sergeant Nordinger and and they go over these incidents together and Nordinger kind of mentors him and says, you know, here's what you did. Maybe here's what you should have done. Um, and they're pretty disturbing. Um, they talk about a traffic stop where a man, the driver, seemed impaired. Sergeant Nordinger says he was likely having a psychotic episode and Officer Lyman punched him and kneed him on the ground to gain compliance. And there were two more incidents where Lyman put people in neck restraints until they became unconscious. And Sergeant Nordinger said, these were not situations that justified that kind of force. Um, Our legislature actually banned neck restraints last year. Um, But Sergeant Nordinger said that Lyman also failed to inform the people that they were under arrest before using that kind of force. And it sounded like Lyman had already had repeated reminders about that. Okay. So another Auburn police officer is getting ready to go on trial soon for murder. That shooting and Officer Lyman's shooting of E.J. Strickland happened just 11 days apart. Auburn is not that large of a department, Amy. What should we make of this? Yeah, for people who aren't aware, um, this is Officer Jeff Nelson. He's been charged uh, with second degree murder of a man named Jesse Saray. You know, I can't draw larger conclusions about the department uh, based on these incidents. You know, I I see these documents um, internal records where police are filing internal complaints over Lyman's use of excessive force. So your own colleague is filing this complaint saying, hey, I saw something wrong happen. You know, I I see supervisors asking Lyman about his crisis intervention training, telling him he got it wrong, telling him he needs to do better. Except Lyman in these transcripts doesn't really seem to acknowledge the problems he's having, the problems with how he's handling these encounters. And when the supervisors ask him questions, about his policies and training, he hesitates. He can't really answer them. That's really important context, Amy, that even his fellow officers were calling attention to his behavior. He's had, according to this lawsuit, a dozen use of force cases. Two have ended in lawsuits. One ended in a man's death. All of this occurring over about seven years. I can imagine a resident of Auburn wondering why he still has a job. Well, and this is the police accountability conversation that, you know, has been ebbing and flowing here for for certainly the last several years. Um, In Lyman's case, I did ask the department uh, for any response or comment, uh, whether he's currently on duty or on any kind of leave. Um, We haven't been able to reach him. We haven't had a comment from the department. The city says they can't comment right now on the federal lawsuit. You know, we do see officers terminated 
in general in Washington, it's rare. It's only for very serious cases of misconduct. They have strong labor protections and, you know, they a chief can terminate them and they might appeal and get reinstated if it's not a really strong case. I have to think that the staffing shortages that we read about constantly in law enforcement are giving departments, you know, a really strong incentive to try to train and improve the performance of their officers who have problems rather than letting them go. Yeah, and this really just gets to this murky area in this profession where how bad is bad enough to be fired when it comes to someone who carries a weapon, who's in a position of power. The thing I'm thinking about as I'm hearing you describe this, besides the fact that it sounds awful for a police officer to act this way, Amy, is that in these cases, it seems like the department is making a determination about Lyman's employment, investigating itself, which seems like a little bit of a conflict of interest. Departments have always had to, you know, hire and fire and do these kinds of internal investigations. Um, I think in the case of the man, Peter Manning, who was hit in the hit and run, you know, he's told, oh, you need to go report and resolve this with Auburn police and deal with them. And he's saying, well, I don't really have confidence that Lyman's colleagues are going to charge him with what could be a misdemeanor or a felony. And traditionally, if that police department that you felt had wronged you, if they didn't respond, you know, where were you going to go? That was the that there was no other recourse. We do have a new state law that is going to make our state's Criminal Justice Training Commission, which is uh, the agency that runs our police academy in Burien, um, they can decertify officers. So they're going beyond firing them in a way. They're saying, you know, you can't work as a police officer in Washington state anymore. And we are going to have a new system where members of the public can file complaints about police misconduct. The commission can choose to investigate. People can even file those complaints and remain anonymous. Um, and one of the things that the commission will be looking at, they say, is if, the, if they see complaints that show there's a pattern, there's a problem within um, an agency or by an officer. So we might see this commission taking action in some of these cases. Amy Radel, police and politics reporter at KUOW. Really appreciate your reporting. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Claire McGrain produced today's show. Matt Jorgensen does our theme music. I'm Patricia Murphy. See you tomorrow.